Okay, thank you very much. Uh, wonderful being here. Sorry for the absence of some philosophers, but there are some <laughs> philosophers present. And uh, the audience is really spectacular, so um, it's a whole other talk. Um, th this morning we have heard uh, uh, Gabriele and, and still give uh, two different, very different, in fact, perspectives on the problem of quantum gravity, uh, both a bit gloomy in, uh, in different, uh, in different uh, manners. Um, I have listened very carefully to what the two of them have said, and I think I would uh, agree and subscribe with uh, uh, virtually all the statements that I have made. Uh, maybe some opinion and some prejudices are different, but I think we, we agree that we have different prejudices, so that's, that's good, because we have to explore different. Um, however, I'm going to now present a different perspective, uh, a third perspective of quantum gravity, uh, which is not so gloomy, and in fact uh, it's uh, far more optimist. And uh, to some extent uh, it's just, uh, you know, is this glass half full or half empty? Um, you can insist on the, what is missing or can insist on what is present. So I'm, I'm going to insist on the um, uh, half empty part of uh, uh, quantum gravity. But uh, I think that... Uh, um, yes. You are going to insist on half full. Half full, yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, 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 please correct me because I took the night train from Marseille, so I didn't sleep. They sleep. So, I mean, no, yeah. No, yeah, well, <laughs> depending if you like more emptiness of, well, okay. Um, uh, I will also insist uh, on things happening in quantum gravity in the last uh, uh, five or ten years in, in various directions, which I think have changed the picture. So the picture is not the same picture for, for, that has been for, for a long time. Um, and, and, and that's largely this experimental evidence that I will uh, talk about. Uh, I will, uh, um, Gabriele started saying I'm scared by the world philosophy, but uh, I'm not, which I don't know whether it uh, weights positively or negatively, but uh, I will uh, talk about uh, what I think are interesting uh, philosophical impl in, in implications of what we do have, of the half full. And uh, uh, in my style I will start with a little bit uh, a set of um, uh, provocative uh, points, which will have to be um, uh, uh, clarified and specified. And uh, this is going to be the, the, the list of things I'm going to talk about. The first two will take most time, the more philosophical one will be take shorter uh, time. So the two, um, a little bit provocative um, statements, the first of all, which I want to claim that we do have quantum theory of gravity is, Gravity. Problem, of course, is yes. We would like to have a quantum theory of gravity, not quantum <laughs> theories. Okay. Uh, but more strongly, and I think this is uh, perhaps the main message of my talk, I want to see that we do have empirical evidence which count. Uh, of course, not as much as we wish. Not, um, there's a lot of qualification that we'll put in, uh, but we do. Um, at the end of the talk, uh, I will pick up the invitation to talk about philosophical issues, and very rapidly I will cover the uh, three topics plus one, um, which I think, uh, after all, there is probably less disagreement um, than it look, looks like among all the people doing quantum gravity. Maybe it's my, my perspective, the, the people I talk to uh, more, um, but I don't find there is this sense of bloom, I don't find a sense of pessimism, and I do find a number of convergence on, on different things. Having said, so we don't have a full theory of gravity on which we agree and this is experimental verified, it's obvious. So I, we do have quantum theory of gravity. Uh, uh, we have not one, but many. Right? This is, if you go into literature, these are all sold as theories of gravities in one way or the other, um, which is obviously uh, too many to be, uh, to be reasonable. But first of all, um, a list like that, uh, it's uh, misleading in a number of uh, reasons. First of all, the number of people involved in the research is, uh, is wide, uh, varies widely uh, from, uh, from uh, 
uh, among this uh, uh, direction, which doesn't mean that um, if we are more we are right and if we are less we are wrong, but it does mean that the community as a whole is going in some direction and not in other. Second, uh, many of these are not really theory of gravity, are ideas, incomplete um, uh, sketch that could be useful, could work, could, could, could live some way, way, but are far from being a quantum theory of gravity. Um, uh, also, the, the many, they're much less than what it looks like, because many are, are connected, right? ADF, CFT, in, in, in the mind of people, is strongly connected to string theory, uh, I don't know, group field theory is, is, is a variant of loop quantum gravity, and so on and so on and so forth. There are more, many uh, connections. Um, the main relation between these, uh, um, some may even be the same theory presented in different, uh, in different manners, uh, the boundary of fluids. Uh, many, as I said, can offer useful insight also within other contexts. But, and this is the last point, a few of these are quantum theory of gravities, with incompleteness, with open questions, uh, but definitely a set of equations with which you can do some calculation uh, which suggest some physical phenomena uh, and uh, indicate some, some, some possible measurable thing that may be right or wrong. And uh, we could test and we'll talk about, uh, I'll, I'll talk about testing in the second part. So this is a sort of uh, completely non-scientific, vague uh, attempt to put things in order. Uh, if you are surprised, let's see, if you are surprised about the string theory loop quantum gravity connection, mm -hmm. this is Hermann Verlinde uh, this summer giving a talk explaining to all of us that quantum gravity come out from string theory. Uh, in 3D there is also next talk in which this happens in 4D. I don't know if you make loop people happy or unhappy with it, string people and unhappy or happy, but this is one of the most respected string theorists around, is, uh, is, uh, is Herman, is the Princeton brother, not the uh, Netherlands brother. So, uh, back here, this is a, a, a list of things. Um, can we get oriented? Yes. First of all, there is a big division here between two different hypotheses. One hypothesis is that one way or the other, at, you cannot go smaller than a certain scale. And uh, this is completely obvious uh, in approaches like to loop quantum gravity, group in theory, as I said, but it's also true within string theory, and I was prepared to, to give argument for that, but Gabriele gave very good arguments exactly in that direction this morning, so I'm not going into, in, into, uh, into that. While the other possibility is that uh, um, there are, the quantum gravity is like quantum field theory, or like the quantum field theory we study at uh, school, at the Code Normal, namely there are infinite number of degrees of freedom all the way down to infinitely small. So these are two, two different worlds which I think are hard to connect uh, to, uh, to one another, at least of first, uh, of first sketch. As I said, uh, there are many things which could be enormously interesting and from which we uh, can learn a lot, uh, but uh, which are not yet quantum theory of gravity. I mean, a, a, a crucial one, Alan is here, I mean, no community geometry in, in, in Alan uh, way could be enormously relevant for telling us how to put gravity together with the other um, theories and how to think about geometry in the very small, uh, but not necessarily it's already a quantum theory of gravity and Alan will correct me if I, if I, if I, if I uh, misrepresented it. Um, but that's not the main thing I wanted to say. The main thing I wanted to say is that this theory has different physics. Some of them, uh, uh, Steve sort of already introduced this a little bit, some of them basically uh, have a physics which is, look, at low energies GR, at high energy there are some quantum effects of some sort. Others have clear uh, other physics, supersymmetry, high dimension, strings, Lorentz violation, violation of quantum mechanics which can be uh, observed and so on. So we are talking about different hypotheses about how the world is. Is the world such that there is this or, or, or there is that? It's Lorentz invariance violated when you go to the Planck scale or not? It's theories exploring different possibility of, um, uh, sort of bringing together what we know about, uh, uh, about the world. So you can make a list. Uh, Lorentz violation uh, some theories say yes, others say no, uh, infinite degrees of freedom, some yes, some no, etc., etc., and you take your favorite, and this is far from 
from incomplete. Which brings me to the second point, which is a uh, uh, main point, is that we do have empirical evidence. We have some empirical evidence which is already here, and some empirical evidence which is uh, uh, perhaps coming soon. And the novelty is that for many years we have been saying, telling one another, oh, we'll never know anything about quantum gravity empirically, we'll have to wait uh, next millennium. Um, so then the next millennium has arrived. <laughs> <laughs> um, so where is it? Well, first, and that's perhaps the most, uh, is Lawrence Marx. Uh, the, one of the approaches uh, that at some point became extremely popular is the uh, Hojama Leibniz theory, which uh, uh, it, it's a very simple um, idea. Uh, if, if, you, if you write a Lorentz invariant theory, you can actually write a renormalizable theory. This is great. I mean, you can write a quantum theory of gravity which is renormalizable, behave nicely at the, the low energy limit. It's, all, it's a quantum theory of gravity. Um, so you mean n is four in your formula? Sorry? n is equal to four? No, I don't. Where is n? n, small n, the exponent. K to the C. Okay. K n is Yeah, n n n is four. It's violation. Lawrence violating yeah. terms. Uh, But you you take n equals four. Four, four, quattro. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> What, what is wrong? I'm sorry. No, no, no. I, I, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, 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 sure. So, so yes. Uh, so, uh, sorry. Um, these suggestions uh, prompted a, a huge experimental effort that went in a number of directions, mostly astrophysical, uh, to test for violations of Lorentz invariance in uh, uh, bursts that come from very far away. We give uh, some uh, dispersion relation, correction to dispersion relation like that and uh, other thresholds uh, um, of the way things interact with the cosmic background deviation and so on and so forth. So, but what I have in mind is that if you want to be an analyzer, you cannot take any plus two, you have to take a different thing. That's the point. I mean, you can get it normalizable with, uh, with, n, equals four. with n equals four. Yeah. Uh, and people started ser searching corrections to this or to this plus the mass. I didn't try the mass case. Generic, <coughs> in fact, uh, uh, for various ends, uh, uh, forgetting your normalizability and, and empirically. And uh, there are a number of phenomena that can be measured. Now, we don't have just LH LHC, we have uh, astrophysics, uh, and uh, there's a huge industry there, and uh, it's remarkable how strong violations of Lorentz invariance has been uh, uh, bounded experimentally. Two numbers, this is a 13, a 19, 2013 review, two numbers which go to uh, my, uh, 10 to the minus 16, uh, depending on the different <coughs> experiments. So among those people, there is a consensus today that uh, corrections of that sort at the Planck scale um, are essentially ruled out could be violation of Lorentz variance of a different kind, or could be some other known thought way, but the, the direct uh, empirical consequences uh, of a theory that violates Lorentz invariance of the Planck scale uh, in the natural way to give the normalizability are empirically um, under enormous stress. Okay? You don't prove a theory wrong, you put very stress, strong stress on the, on the theory. That's the first point. Um, a small parenthesis, uh, uh, if we bring this uh, Lorentz invariance to the Planck scale with the idea that there is some sort of discreteness at the Planck scale, does this imply that, uh, is it possible, or is there a contradiction between the two? It's often said that there is a contradiction between the two, and there is a contradiction between the two if you have a classical Uh, discreteness. There is no contradiction between the two if you have a, a, a quantum discreteness. Uh, just think about uh, angular momentum theory. You have, you have discreteness and, 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 and you have the, the symmetry with uh, the two things uh, go together. I skip this uh, um, because it, it could be a little bit more in, in detail, but the two are compatible. We, we, we know that we have representations of the 
from legal to final division. Exactly, exactly, right, exactly. Isn't, isn't it important that, that the group is non-compact? It is, but it not, does not change the result. It doesn't change. I, are, how sure are you of that? 100%. <laughs> Which is what I, what I answer when I don't want I to continue the discussion. I, I'm happy to continue the discussion later, but we have, Ted and I have been discussing this for long. I'm pretty convinced of that. Uh, so we can, it can be one of the topics in the, in the, in the discussion this afternoon. Yeah, actually, it's on the previous transparency. My recollection was that they could eliminate, um, uh, rule out large violations if you take n equals 3. You say even for n equals 4? No. No, no, no. no. I'm ah, saying, no, I'm no, saying no. that uh, the, 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 ex, the, the people doing measurements uh, don't care about uh, what the theoreticians in detail want. There's an open chance, which is to measure Lorentz invariant violating effects uh, at high energy, and they tried... I thought the case N equal 4 was hopeless. Was it? Hopeless. It was ruled out. No, no, hopeless. Yeah, I think you're right, it's hopeless. Hopeless... Uh, hopeless to check. Right. No. It's the numbers that... Uh, that uh, is, that's the point. But that was 10 years ago. But uh, N, N equal 4, look at the numbers. That's the point. The value of CN? CN. Okay, I'm very surprised. I, I know, but this is thing that's been changing in the last... I mean, there are conferences. The title is uh, um, Phenomenological Quantum Gravity. And they discuss this kind of things. They're astrophysicists. I'm surprised they're... that in a few years uh, there has been so much technological progress. <laughs> um, Crab nebula, neutrino oscillations... Uh, uh, it's a number of techniques. I don't, I don't want to go into, into that. Uh, let me skip this. Uh, uh, second supersymmetry. This is even more controversial. Now, here you want to say, try to say things uh, uh, precisely. It is a fact that uh, um, the expected uh, supersymmetry uh, at uh, Lepfus and LHC later is not coming out. Um, this is one, just, I, I just picked a recent one of the many uh, articles that are coming out. No evidence is found for you know, supersymmetry beside the standard model. Uh, so I want to claim that uh, this obviously does not, uh, once again, does not uh, uh, rule out supersymmetry, because supersymmetry can be a higher scale, um, and does not uh, disprove in the Popperian sense any theory unless it's a theory that really, really, really wants supersymmetry of that particular energy. Uh, but uh, since we're asked to think philosophically, I think this brings in a point about uh, philosophy of science, which I want to uh, underline. Uh, we all know Popperian uh, falsificationism well, but Popperian falsificationism is a criterion for demarcation between science and not science. Uh, it's not very good as a criterion for evaluating uh, theories, uh, and that's not what scientists do, or have done, or have ever done, because according to Popper theory, I have a theory that there are giraffes in the Alps, and nobody can falsify it, right? Uh, there are, the, in the Alps, there are many giraffes, uh, but they're very good in hiding. It's a, it's a part of my theory. It's completely unfalsifiable, right? Or there are giraffes on the backside of the moon. I mean, they're, they're a special giraffe. They have to be small giraffes. Yeah, yeah, I can do the normal eyes and things. And things and, I mean, I can do things, but of course, like, it's non perturbative when, the, when you. That's not the way. The point is that that's not the way in which you evaluate theories. The way we evaluate theory, one possible way of, um, of thinking about that is that uh, we associate degree of confidence to the theory that can go to very low, actually five is very, very low, to very high. Um, uh, uh, QED is extremely, extremely high with things in between. I mean, SO10 is uh, low, but not so low, and so on and so forth. And in the theories that we're working on, also we de give degrees of confidence, which is what motivates us to work in one theory or, or the other. I mean, String theory is interesting because there's a number of things that increase our confidence in it, and we heard from uh, Gabriele a number of reasons for taking it seriously. Right? So this increase. But in the same manner, there are things that decrease confidence in theory. 
And everything that, if it would happen, would have increased the confidence level of the theory, obviously finding supersymmetry does not prove string theory right. But I would say, a lot of people in the string theory community would say, great, it's an indication that we're on the right track. Not finding where it was expected decreases the uh, level, the common level of competence in the theory. This is what happened de, de facto. So, um, not seeing a giraffe in the Alps does not prove a... Maybe there are giraffes, let's see. Oh, look, there's a giraffe. <laughs> uh, but for 30 years, nobody sees a giraffe. Well, you start thinking maybe there are no giraffes in the Alps, right? And uh, we have heard that supersymmetry is going to be seen soon more than, for more than 30 years. So I think there is, a, there is a moment in which you say this does not disprove anything in the Popperian sense, but it's a fact that uh, there is more stress on the uh, quantum gravity solution that uh, require that. A third uh, direction of empirical evidence is laboratory experiments. Uh, Steve has already talked about a number of that. Uh, um, just a few comments. Uh, there is a lot going on in analog systems for black holes and things like that. Uh, my take is that uh, they tell us about the theory but they don't tell us anything about the world. Because uh, uh, we have a theoretical model, say, of Hawking radiation, we find a condensed matter system which has the same equations in some regime, and, and of course we find the consequences that are the same consequences of... Uh, mm -hmm. So we test our understanding of the theory, we don't test whether the theory is right or wrong. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not that these things are not interesting, they're enormously interesting, but they're not telling us about black holes, they're telling us about the theory we're using for black holes. Um, there are many uh, other Planck scale effects in, in the lab that have been tested uh, and uh, uh, it's good that Steve uh, made a list of them. Most of them, predict, uh, most of them test things that were not actually predicted by any quantum gravity theory I know, like this um, interference between, quantum interference between different um, arms of two, two um, interferometers. Oh, definitely, uh, relevant are the kind of experience that test quantum superposition which could rule out uh, theories like panels <laughs> to which little not many people have a lot of credence in uh, in, in, in it panels says quantum gravity breaks the linearity of Lawrence of uh, quantum mechanics now this can be tested in the lab and in uh, in Vienna and other places people try to to do that everybody would bet that quantum Bohr wins and Penrose lose, and then we're basically a square one uh, with a little bit less credibility in Penrose's hypothesis, but we haven't learned much. <coughs> but, and this is a fourth thing, um, there are uh, uh, proposed uh, 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 laboratory experiments uh, to test whether the gravitational field is classical, and you know, it's a bit, I, I was completely surprised. In, in my talk, I essentially had a single reference. Paper, since the paper references, and Steve Cadlip, I mean, we haven't talked, we haven't, we, we haven't talked for several months, and he gave a talk and had the same reference. <laughs> so um, this is the same as he, he described. Uh, you take one particle in a superposition, another particle in a superposition, and then uh, there is an interference of the two which is built by the fact that uh, this particle is in the uh, gravitational field of this superimposed to the gravitational field of that. Now you're going to think, oh, wait a moment, I mean this is too weak. I'm confused, I thought it was the interaction between the two massive. It's, uh, the, this one is, is the potential of this, plus in the sense of quantum mechanics, the potential of this. So there are three distances, there are this one, the long one, and two intermediate ones. Now, is not the attraction that matters here, it's a uh, it's, uh, time dilation, is the fact that uh, since the potential is a little bit different, time goes at different speed, so the phase turn, mm -hmm. the quantum phase turn at different speed, mm -hmm. so um, the quantum phase of this uh, turns uh, uh, in one branch of the universe on, 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 on the rate given by that, on the other, the, 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 if you put everything together, there the, 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 the are the four 
the, the combined state is not a tensor state anymore because this factor here depends on different distances. And the, the, if you want to evaluate the strength of the uh, effect, it's very simple because just look at this factor. Sure. And it's a separation, h bar, g, m, and the time uh, they stay there. So you take the m of nanoparticles, because these are the ones you can superimpose, and you compute t, and as Steve said, then you get a second or two. So if you just can hold this thing, they get entangled. And then these people have good ways to test whether they're entangled or not, because that's a job. And so there's a, uh, if they are entangled, it means that each one of these was on the superposition of two different potentials, which means that they're going to feel in, 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 it's quantized in this sense, is it? It can be the superposition. Is it a gravitational field which is quantized? Yes. Or, or it's a gravitational field which is quantized. No, no, the particles are quantized, and that's given for granted. Yeah, so, uh, so if you want... How do you know that it's a gravitational field that is quantized? Because uh, uh, this one sits not on a single potential, but on a superposition of two potentials. Yeah, that doesn't matter for... Uh, that is true even if, if, uh, if gravity is classical. If gravity is the same uh, as space-time, then uh, there is a single space-time, there is a single gravitational field, there is a single Newtonian potential. You cannot have two Newtonian potentials. Because I think on states, if you don't have to quantize the gravitational field, you this spread it. Okay, I have to think. Yeah, the, the condenser and other people think differently. They think this is a quantum system, is a quantum system, the only way to entangle the two is via quantum something. They have a theorem that says you cannot entangle two things without the class. Yeah. That's the way they think of it. Doesn't the argument apply to the electromagnetic field? The electromagnetic field created by uh, No, but you have to shift. The position of two. Is it really the sum of the two or not? Yes, it is. Absolutely. You can use... You can use. Uh, you, to the field. you can do it in quantum field theory, and then you have a you have a, you have a, you have a photon, a longitudinal photon uh, that uh, it's uh, it's in a quantum superposition. It's not in, a, in an eigenstate of its. Uh, it's not in a semi-classical configuration. How do you know that there will be no external influence on this? <laughs> yeah. Well. It, the, internal, the, the good thing is that the, the, the internal thing go, works for you, not against you, in the sense that uh, they cancel the effect. So if you see the effect, you're pretty sure that... Uh, we're going to wait. This is, uh, there are two different groups that have come out with the same proposal at the same time. I have the two references here. What is the nature? Uh, oh, if, uh, is, is nature last year? And what is the same that... Uh... Uh, all right. Third, and, la and uh, uh, fourth, and last, uh, experimental evidence, this is also in the future. And this is, the message is also not, we have experimental evidence here, but there's a community is expecting it to come soon. Uh, in two directions, uh, early universe, quantum cosmology, there's a huge amount of work, whether it will work or not, we, we have seen. And I want to say something more about black holes, because uh, um, that's what... Uh, uh, a uh, number of people, including my group, have been involved in this. Uh, um, cosmology, it's very simple. I mean, you have your quantum theory of gravity that in one way or the other talks about the Big Bang, you expect to see effect of the CNB. So there are hundreds of people there computing um, corrections to the standard CNB prediction of inflation <coughs> due to early effect um, at the Planck time. and. Uh, 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 the, the claim is that with some uh, assumptions about the quantum gravity physics at the very, very early universe, uh, uh, you might predict something which could turn out to be visible soon. So far, nothing has uh, uh, happened yet. But I want to mention this because there's a large number of people focusing and working on that. What is available in the, in the horizontal direction? Oh, here? Yeah. Uh, the multiple expansion of the, 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 the degree in the sky, uh, you, you, the, the, the CNB um, uh, distribution expanded in angular moment in mode uh, in, in uh, modes on the sphere. So it's L, the angular. It's a distance. 
the angular distance of the angle. Yes. To pi of red or something like this is there. So this is a this is a prediction of the current cosmology and, and it, the, 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 the data points are spectacularly good <coughs> uh, the idea is that to distinguish standard cosmology from some quantum gravity cosmology whether it's you need to go to the low mode you, know? you need to do the low mode where where we have uh, uh, of course of course it's, uh, it's far from obviously going to work because there is a statistical you know, few points so the, the error bars are necessarily large there uh, but there's big community working there. And now let me talk about black holes. Um, I'll spend a little bit more time on that. Okay, I'm doing very good uh, this time. Uh, the point is that uh, this is a this is black hole saying Schwarzschild coordinate. So this is Schwarzschild radius and Schwarzschild time. So something that falls uh, doesn't fall in these coordinates here. Now. Uh, this still represents the interior of the black hole. Here, near R equals zero, the curvature diverges. And uh, before diverging, it gets to Planckian value, and that's where we expect quantum gravity phenomena to happen, inside the black hole. But uh, a number of people have come out observing that uh, there are quantum gravity phenomena that uh, happen for long times, uh, when the time is long, even if uh, in a region where you wouldn't expect uh, directly uh, quantum effect. In other words, quantum effect can be small, but over a long time they can pile up and do something. Uh, the, the quintessential one is tunneling. You take a, a, a hydrogen atom, uh, sorry, an uranium atom, you put it there, you put the detector here, you look at the, around the detector, there's no reason for quantum phenomena to happen, but after a while it clicks because an alpha particle or whatever comes out. So, uh, if you, if you uh, compute the, the curvature uh, times the time at a distance r, at a Schwarzschild distance r, uh, the product of the two has a maximum uh, a little bit outside the Schwarzschild radius, and uh, it uh, reaches Planckian value after a time which is uh, uh, m squared in Planck unit. It's very, very long for a macroscopic uh, black hole, but it's short compared to Hawking radiation. Uh, time. So a number of people have come up saying, look, maybe uh, there are quantum gravity phenomena outside the black hole due to that. And there is a, a, a number of suggestions. I want to mention two, one by Steve Giddings, um, which is to very soon we'll have the, um, the uh, Event Horizon Telescope, which is this bringing radio telescopes online uh, from all around the Earth, uh, which build a sort of single radio telescope with the size of the Earth, uh, with which we're going to see the black hole. We're going to resolve the Schwarzschild radius. Okay? So this is a simulation of what we're going to see. Um, and the black hole, the, the, the easiest black hole to see is the one in the center of our galaxy, Sagittarius A star. Uh, we're talking about microseconds of arc of resolution. So this thing should see a tennis ball on the moon. And the tennis ball on the moon remarkably correspond to a to a uh, the, the black hole at the center of the galaxy our angle of evolution we actually uh, helped by lensing uh, lensing increase, increases the the effective angle of evolution so uh, we have a, there are a lot of phenomena which happen around the black hole that can be uh, uh, observed uh, and, and and it's calculation and and if if there's something outside the black hole, it might have some effect. And Steve Giddens has suggested that it may disrupt the photon ring and uh, there is something observable there. That's one possibility. It's stretched, uh, but uh, it, it, it's, uh, the, 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 the people in observations are going to look into that. The thing which uh, um, we've been working in loop quantum gravity, I'm going to talk about loop quantum gravity in a moment because I want to talk about our work in loop quantum gravity for a Two or three slides also. Uh, it's uh, um, so this is a collapsing shell, uh, a black hole, and the possibility that through a quantum region um, you can explode. The, the black hole can disrupt and and uh, and explode. So this will be the the Carter-Penrose diagram. You, you have the shell here coming out, and the, 
The reason this is uh, interesting is that there is an actual solution of Einstein equations, a true solution of Einstein equation, exact. Uh, here, 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 in the black hole, in the white hole, here, everywhere, with, with some matter collapsing and bouncing out, uh, except in a region, and so you can view the region where the Einstein equations are violated as tunneling, quantum tunneling. Okay? Any quantum mechanics permits everything, provided that it's short time, small, and there's a suppression of probability which uh, suppresses it. Um, so we've been studying, this is an old idea in fact, it's, uh, it's all people, a lot of people have worked on that starting from fall of this police in the late 70s uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the picture has been increasingly increasingly clear and, and we have found external metrics nicely so we can do calculations and this is loop quantum gravity. So once you have a quantum theory you can ask uh, what is the actual amplitude for this transition, right? For the, Uranium atom, you can use standard quantum theory to compute the lifetime of an uranium atom on the basis of a simple model of the nucleus and the, how the particle can escape the, the potential well uh, inside. These are the basic equation of loop quantum gravity. Um, this is the kinematics, this is a way, I'm not going to go into that. This is a way of computing amplitude, it's a well-defined set of equations, so you can do computation with that. And the way you work with these equations, which is important for the what I'm going to say in a moment about space and time, uh, is that uh, they allow you essentially to do the path integral on the metric, intuitively, at given boundary. So given the gravitational field and the matter fields here and here, you compute an amplitude. Or more precisely, given a state on a boundary, you can do an amplitude associated with this state. So I go back, this is the Hilbert space. These are the operators that connect that to the gravitational field and to geometry. And this is just a, a way of computing the, uh, the transition amplitude. Okay, that's the way the theory, uh, the theory works. And uh, uh, let me now, this, I'm, I'm talking about the theory in which uh, I'm working and I mean, a few hundred people around the world is working. The theory is far from in, being complete. There are a lot of things which are unclear, there are variants, there are, there are but uh, this was the, the, I added this slide while Steve Karlik was uh, talking this morning. He said the requirement is a quantum theory, the Hilbert space operators transition amplitude. Uh, the classical limit, there are theorems indicating that the classical limit is right. There's no strong complete proof uh, at all, but a strong indication of the classical limit is right. <coughs> of course, these things depend on the level of completeness of rigor. <coughs> some mathematicians say that nobody has proven that Newton's theory comes from general relativity in some limit. So if you want extreme rigor. We are certainly not at that level of rigor, but uh, uh, the amplitude can be shown to go to the exponential of I, the classical general relativity action in some under some conditions. Uh, there are no ultraviolet divergences. This is strong, the theorems, and the reason is pretty clear, that sort of... Uh, uh, there's a minimum length, and there's an attempt of understanding black holes and dynamics of it. So I wanted to say, not that this is a final theory of quantum gravity, not that this is a proved or empirically supported theory of quantum gravity, but it's a theory of quantum gravity. And string theory is a theory of quantum gravity. Gabriele is computing scattering and, 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 and finding, finding a result with this. So this is the way it works, <clears throat> and you see, where is space and time? Well, there's no space and time. You only have boundary states, which have interpretation of three geometries. And so, in quantum gravity, suppose you're at CERN, at CERN and this is a, a scattering thing, you want to give the boundary data, which include the particles, the distances, and the time. So the boundary state knows about the geometry, the boundary geometry, which include how much time has passed. So time is the integral of square root of g mu nu, the x mu, the x nu, along the line. It's in the gravitational field, it's not, it's not external. So we know the geometry outside, we can compute the three geometry, intrinsic and intrinsic, of this region. We can use a theory within a truncation for computing this amplitude, the boom, 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 you work uh, with uh, three graduate students for three years, and that's the result. And then we try to 
uh, extract from it uh, the, de the dependence of the bouncing time from the mass, essentially, how long it takes this uh, thing for. We were working on this yesterday. Uh, the reason I took the night train is because yesterday there was a thesis in Marseille of a uh, poor guy, Marius Christodoulou, who spent uh, years struggling with these equations and trying to understand. Of course, I, I skip all the complication, technical. Uh, but, you, but what does it mean? For instance, um, and uh, there are many papers study the phenomenology of that, if there are primordial black holes, this is expanding the universe. Um, a black hole collapsed say at the end of inflation, in the heating phase, uh, could explode a certain time, say m square after, and we see the signal uh, of it. And uh, knowing the, how the mass depends on the time, you can compute things, and the key thing you can compute um, is the fact that, that uh, um, you see, if a black hole, ex if one of these explosions happens farther away from us, the black hole has lived less, so it must be smaller, so there is an effect that counterbalance redshift. So instead of the standard redshift curve, you have a flattened redshift curve. If we find something like that, this is a hint, this is a sign, what, what else can have a flattened redshift curve, that these are exploding black holes via quantum tunneling. What is the Z then? Redshift. So a function of what? Of the, of the wavelength, I see. The, lev the so wavelength is a function so of... It would be a shrinking... Or yeah, it, instead, of, yeah. instead of the standard yeah. shift, which is linear, you have, a, you have a, the thing far away, you see that it's more... The more ratio of the, of less the, the shift. Of the, of the radiation lines would be... Exactly. 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 So this is a testable thing, computed with a quantum theory of gravity. It might be wrong, and, and, and or we may have mistakes. The theory is, is, is one is doing physics with these uh, things here. And in fact, uh, this is, a, you probably know, the uh, square kilometer array, this big thing, you know, telescopes with many little components that they're building in uh, Australia and South Africa. And in their white paper, in which uh, they say what you wanna, they want to do, they have a full chapter on quantum gravity, uh, primordial black hole exploding. They are looking for that. They, are, they consider it as one of the things that it's worth investing in. So this closed the um, experimental part, uh, the empirical uh, part. I want to say that uh, there are at least four directions in which we are either already the first two or hopefully in, in the future, but really hopefully, uh, time to say something. And uh, the ones we already have, uh, it's a uh, 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 Lorentz invariant, which are put on enormous stress. <coughs> Uh, Lorentz violating theories. Of course, you can still have a normalizable theory where the Lorentz variation scale is much, much beyond the Planck scale. But it becomes less, less. You can always cheat your theory, right? Theoreticians know that nothing can be disproved. Um, I argued and uh, that uh, not finding supersymmetry at LH lab, lab first and LHC second put some weight. Um, against the idea uh, that supersymmetry is the right direction in the, the scheme of the world, even of course it, it can be a higher energy. Uh, soon we'll have a, probably, uh, if all goes well, a, 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 a very strong empirical indication that you can put geometry on superpositions. And uh, uh, if there is some hope, not certainly at all, that uh, uh, somehow we could see quantum gravity effect in the sky. Uh, I don't know if you want to go through this transparency because I will make a lot of enemies, but uh, uh, <laughs> allow me to go to go through it and take it with a with a, with a smile, please, and not with. Uh, so I'm, I'm I'm open to violent criticism. In the late eighties, uh, in loop quantum gravity, these were the open problems. If you would go to a conference, everybody would discuss these problems. Steve Carlby would say, look, guys, you in loop quantum gravity, you don't have a clean definition of universe space, the mathematical foundation is shaky, you don't have coupling to matter, you don't know how to recover the etc. 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 Many years have passed, uh, there have been enormous amount of war. This is completely co under control. This is completely under control. This has been worked out. So there are papers that say ca matter coupling can be done like that, but never used. So yes, but uh, Carl, I have a question there on the coupling of matter. You see, uh, I mean, from a far distance, I don't know loop quantum gravity. 
from a far distance, what uh, always made me a little bit skeptical is the fact that uh, you know we have learned over the years so much from quantum field theory and randomization, and uh, I mean, uh, which gave predictions which are you know, unbeatable. And somehow, you know, I never saw anywhere in what I heard about loop quantum gravity that actually was giving some hope that it could be compatible with this type of computations. Um, okay, it's two things. Good, good. It's two things. Um, uh, it's two separate things. First of all, the Hilbert space of the quant of the the state of space is uh, has this graph structure, mm -hmm. and uh, it's um, it's this one, mm -hmm. which is the Hilbert space of lattice QCD. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, it's very easy to put matter to couple fermions with lattice QCD. It's just the way lattice QCD people do it. And it's very no, easy to add another... No, 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 no
uh, have a that's the part that we don't control, of course, we control less the limit of matter. So you have a truncation, uh, order by order in n, which is a truncation in degrees of freedom, at each order of which there is an intrinsic cutoff for the Planck scale. So at each order, you don't have ultraviolet divergences that come in. Question, do we have divergences in the continuum limit? Presumably, I don't know. I have no idea. Okay, this is going in the... No, this was not my question, no. My question was, can you reproduce the results that are actually obtained by the theory through this technique? You see, what, what you are telling me is that you can imitate the, the lattice case theory because the, the, the framework is similar. But this doesn't tell me that at some point you can actually you know, say, well, look, by doing this type of calculation, I obtain the same result as what people would obtain from the theory by using the normalization. Yes, yes, uh, de de depend of what exactly you mean. If, if the question, I mean, uh, Gabriel has been long, every time he meets me, can you compute the normalization of lambda from the Planck scale to, to yeah. and I... I, I yeah, and I'm asking a simple question, I'm asking about matter, just matter. Yeah, 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 sure, because the, the matter part... Uh, your, let's see, your, your point is that if you superimpose, say, the lattice QCD, the, the space-time structure that he's talking about, you may upset the way you compute. Things. Well, it's not. I, I I have no prejudice. I just want, if you want, what I would say is that the theory would be more convincing if it were possible by doing that mm -hmm. to actually say, okay, look, for instance, I can predict the constant which nobody else can predict. Or something like that. Uh, no, I can do that, but I can say that. Then, uh, then this means that you cannot avoid infinities because the infinities are there precisely to give you the freedom to have these three parameters, which are the parameters of renormalization. If, if you don't have these infinities, you are, you are forced to predict a value like the strong coupling or whatever. They don't have infinities, so how can they do? Oh no, but they have, they have other parameters. Exactly. No, but you see, so I said... That's I the point, it's that's the point. Dangerous. It's very dangerous to say that you don't have divergences. If, because... Not uh, that, that was the first, I mean... That was the first uh, slide. That's why I put the first slide on. So, um, sorry. Either you think the, there are two big um, set of prejudices to quantum gravity. Each of, each of us start with prejudices. That's why then we disagree, of course. Okay, which is good because then we explore different directions. I can never prove that my prejudices are better than yours. The only chance is uh, one prejudice is uh, is uh, is this one. One prejudice is is, is, is this one. So uh, this is the logic of asymptotic safety, which is possible. That's another real existing quantum theory of gravity, which open questions. So it's uh, haven't proved, etc., etc., etc. Uh, uh, causal dynamic integration also works in the same in the same manner. So the idea is, uh, um, quantum gravity should work like quantum field theory. Namely, uh, there are this uh, infinite normalization group that goes all the way to, to infinity, and this is the way we uh, we describe uh, the radiative corrections uh, in a sort of uh, way that does not sit on 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 some. Uh, uh, on some length scale. The other prejudice is uh, that uh, the world is not like that. The world is like condensed matter. It's ultimately like condensed matter in some elegant and strange manner, but it's like condensed matter. So there's a scale. There are atoms and molecules, and you can do the quantum field theory of the phonons, you can do... it's all wonderful, but this beautiful mathematics of renormalization we have actually is an approximation Infinite is a population to many, of, of, of something that sits on a, on a discrete structure down there, of some sort. Now, classically, you can have a, not a discrete structure, but you can have a discrete structure in the sense that the size of things is given by operators with a discrete spectrum, and this gives QCD with a cutoff. Maybe we can postpone well, this. You, you have to reinterpret, for instance, the, the running and the normalization group as a as flow in the infrared. Exactly. exactly. So, uh, we, no, but it, this is exactly my question. So my question is, in fact, much more precise. You see, uh, what I would uh, consider as being uh, progress would be if 
you could fancy uh, at the Planck scale okay, some theory which is which has a huge huge number of degrees of freedom due to the Planck scale, and then follow the randomization group down so yeah. to the yeah. infrared exactly, okay. and then get results which are consistent with what we see. That I would completely agree with, yeah. but I don't see it in in uh, so so far. If you want. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure that uh, each of us in each other theory don't see things that would like to think. I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to sell a final theory and saying, look, you should all agree with have solved all the problems. They're open problems. I was agreeing with the line when you say compatible with matter. You know, so compatible with matter in the sense that I, I have a version of those equations that I, I, I put down, which all, which is not written here, which include matter, okay. and which naively. Uh, give uh, fermions and Yang that's, that's, that's it's in a very simple way, yeah. and uh, it's uh, this and 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 then there's a bunch of paper by Thomas Tiemann saying, look, naively this is like matter cut off of the Planck scale. Um, I definitely don't have the calculation that you would like to, and, and even worse, I don't have the calculation that. Gabriel is asking me, namely, okay, good, so you have all this, uh, why don't you compute the renormalization of lambda then from, from, is it big, is it small, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, I would say it's a factor of three, but, uh, <laughs> sorry. The cosmological constant, the Ranian is a cosmological constant from the, or the, or, or, or the Higgs, or the Higgs, or the Higgs mass, which is the same. So we, we don't disagree on the on the substance. We disagree on the on, on what we consider uh, crucial, uh, important. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. So I, I, this was a non-controversial part. Definitely not. Okay. Now, this was a rhetorical thing, because uh, now Gabriel is going to be very angry. I want to compare this with uh, what was a list of problems in string theory in the 80s. So take, a, pro take a, pa pa a paper in the 80s and see what are the... This is what everybody hoped to do at the time, right? Compute the parameter of the standard model, deriving this, uh, finding the fundamental formulation of theory, the set of fundamental equations. And I think everybody would agree. <laughs> That actually, this is this here. I'm far more optimistic than uh, than than Gabriele. I think there is much more understanding of non-perturbative string theory today, and there are spectacularly beautiful thing in uh, with the dualities, which in, I think do teach us something about quantum gravity. I've seen beautiful calculations which have a black hole inside, and you do the uh, the 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 you can use the duality to compute the the. Uh, two-point functions at infinity, and you see how, uh, before taking a limit, which is not a physical limit because of uh, a Planck scale, uh, the theory is unitary, there's no information loss, uh, and you lose it just in the moment in which you do the limit. So there are things with a lot of... And also, uh, <laughs> uh, string theory had predictions, except that they got wrong. <laughs> now, this is a strongly biased perspective. I'm about sure. About understanding the entropy. Yes. Yeah. Well, I would say a yes for both. I would say a, a yes for both. Say, yeah, I would say a yes for both. I mean, of course, it's a, to some extent, there are calculation of s, or maybe more yes here than there. I mean, this. I don't want. To. Okay. So, how much time do I have? Zero. Okay. Um, more philosophical issue, nature of physical space. Um, this is something I, um, I, I care a lot. Uh, philosophers used to uh, uh, say that there are two ways of thinking about space. Is the, 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 the Newtonian way, in which you have an entity over which things move, yes. and the relational way, in which you have just things that move, um, and space are uh, the relation of who is next to who. Um, now, let me go very fast through the ontology of physics. Uh, Descartes had just uh, matter, which had the property of extension. It's Newton who invented this uh, entity space, uh, and uh, space which is there even if you take away matter, 
and time which passes even if nothing happened. Right? It's a very Newtonian idea. Uh, but then things started to evolve because uh, Faraday Maxwell added the field to the ontology of uh, fundamental physics. Einstein realized that it's hard to separate these two. Uh, Einstein again realized that space time is just a field. So in classical general relativity, we learn that uh, there is a gravitational field and particles, and that's it. There isn't a space time uh, separated from the field. Space time is a field. And uh, in quantum mechanics, we, we see that the field have particle-like properties. I mean, light is made by photons in some sense, and, uh, and, and, and electrons have their own Dirac field. Uh, if you bring everything together, you have, uh, uh, you have just one object, which is covariant quantum fields, from which particles, fields, uh, space and time emerge in approximation in, 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 uh, in, uh, in various manners. So this is a... This is a picture I have in mind. Uh, Pre-general relativity, you have fields over space-time, and uh, when you quantize them, you see the quantum, the particles. It's just the, the, the excitations, the quantum excitations of the field is some very, very... If your space-time, which is can curve because it's general relativity, is a field, it is made by quanta. And uh, if you want, look at quantum gravity, it's the mathematics of this thing here. So, continuous space-time emerge from the states of the Hilbert space exactly in the same manner in which continuous electromagnetic field emerge from Fox space. We know how to do that, right? We know how to go into Fox space, go to the particle basis, the N basis, NK basis, and from that say, look, I have a continuous electromagnetic field where I just build a coherent state, which is a good approximation of that and some. I can do exactly the same thing. Can you? So, yes. Can you really? Can you prove that you have nearly Minkowski space from, uh, from the amplitudes? With oh, I will say yes for the electromagnetic field. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was my I yes in yes. total confidence. Yes. <laughs> uh, no, 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 I take away the yes in total confidence. Um, <laughs> Uh, there is a lot of work on, uh, on the basis of this Hilbert space theory and this operator here to build coherent states here. This coherent state looking like classical geometries on large scale, of course, not if you go down on large scale, having small fluctuations compared <coughs> to... So there's a huge amount of literature on coherent states uh, uh, there. And there is a huge amount of literature that uh, connects the transition amplitudes to the classical action, or more precisely to the classical uh, Hamilton function, which is the action as a function of the initial and, uh, and, uh, and, and final states. I'm not defending the technicalities here, I'm, I'm defending the, the overall picture. So if the technicalities work, this is a clear and consistent way of thinking of continuous space-time as emerging as a semi-classical description, uh, cla uh, current state description of some um, discreteness. Uh. I have some, some questions, uh, again, which is the following, which in fact came in Carly's uh, so when he was talking about his uh, uh, causal networks. So, I mean, the problem with these approaches is like the following. It's like, you know, you have a framework, and uh, it will not, in general, be too difficult in that framework to find what you want to find. Maybe you, you might be able to find in the space, or you might be able to, but you will also find, you will <laughs> also be able to find my grandmother riding a bicycle. Oh, you see what I'm saying? I mean, <laughs> what, what I'm saying is that it's a framework that actually is so loose because you are allowed to take limits and to, to, to do this and that, that, I mean, there, there is no ground that it actually represents physics. It could represent anything. Yeah. Um, and I think this, the similar criticism happens for string theory because of the huge family of vacua that you have. So, I mean, to, to me, this is the main problem in the approach. I mean, you know, it's always possible to actually realize somewhere in your huge landscape that you are, to realize what you want. The problem is that you don't have any reason to believe that this is, you know, that, that you are actually uh, targeting the, the, the only thing which is the wrong, or that there is some... Uh, some Alain, if you, yes. if you keep raising general question, I cannot get to the transparency with your name, so... Well, 
<laughs> Which is the next one. Um, this is a... Look, um, we have transitional amplitudes that in the limit of small h bar, of course, in the proper limit of small h bar and before the limit n going to infinity, uh, become the exponential of the Einstein action. Yeah, but of the Einstein action for what? For something that you put in by n? No, 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 no. The, the, the Hamilton function, I mean, given uh, the initial three geometry and the final three geometry... Yeah, but you have to keep this. Who's yeah. Have you have to for any three geometry, for any initial or final three geometry, up to the degeneracy complications, there is a classical solution between the two. When there is a classical solution of the two, there is a value of the action. Time. Um, there is no time here yeah, in the transition amplitude. Uh, this is very simple, and this is my standard way of thinking about that. Uh, we use time clocks. Clocks were uh, had an oscillator, the guy who realized that oscillations don't depend on the amplitude of Galileo. He was in the Pisa Cathedral, he used a pulse to measure that the period of the oscillation of a big chandelier. A few years later, uh, doctors use uh, clocks for measuring the pulse of the patients. So we all measure pulses in times of clocks, uh, oscillator. Everybody relies on Galileo's pulse for... Uh, it seems completely circular and of course it's not... The point is that wonderfully explained by Newton at the beginning of the Principia where he says that uh, his time, not the, the, not the, uh, the, 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 the stupid time that uh, Descartes and uh, Aristotle think about, but his mathematical time is not something we observe something we compute because we observe quantities like the angle of something oscillating, the, hand, the angle of the handle. The, uh, and uh, what we observe is uh, how this quantity changes one respect to the other. And as Newton says, it's very convenient to compute, calculate, guess, uh, find a variable t and describe everything how it evolves in t and have clocks, think about clocks as a set of things that evolve well together thinking of approximating this, uh, this invisible uh, T. Which means that, of course, we can describe the world without T. It's very inconvenient in uh, um, outside generativity, is necessary in generativity. In fact, in generativity, you use a coordinate time, which is not connected to anything directly measurable, is an arbitrary uh, level. So um, at the elementary level, uh, nature is not organized in terms of uh, uh, evolution uh, uh, in time. Um, I go back. Um, there's no time here. How do we, oops, how do we uh, work with time? Uh, I thought that I had a transparency before, sorry. Um, in this way here. So time is in the, in, in the boundary data. Is, is, is one of the variables of the gravitational field. One, well, the one you're using in that particular experiment you're interested. In the case of the Bouncing black hole, you just put yourself as some charge radius and there's a proper time between what you see the thing coming in and what the same thing coming out. You want uh, to compute that uh, uh, as a function of the mass. So I think that uh, there is no, oops, there is no really mystery of time like it was in the 60s when William DeWitt wrote the equations. It can be worked out uh, uh, completely uh, and uh, uh, the, 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 the arrival point is that at the fundamental level we don't need a time variable. Having said so, the question is uh, what is the relation between this absence of fundamental time in the uh, sort of just given algebra and, and, and our experiential time? Well, I think that the answer is that our experiential time is a, is a lot of layers. And we do find aspect of time at different la layers when we describe uh, the, the theory and we go up to uh, either specific approximation or more uh, um, partial descriptions. At the fundamental level of a different variant uh, quantum field theory, there is Alain uh, um, uh, flow. Um, the uh, flow of inner automorphism, which a von Neumann algebra defined by itself, which is there. It's, that's part of it. 
uh, which is related to the thermal time because uh, the, 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 the inner flow is just a, an equivalent class of uh, uh, outer flows, each one related to a notion of, air, uh, of energy and, and clock. Uh, so for every clock, uh, for every uh, energy, you have a possible notion of time and you have an equilibrium state which, uh, with, with respect to that time. So equilibrium states are, are related to time, if you, and so on and so forth. To go to a single unit time, you have to go to the relativistic limit. There's no single unit time in, in, in classical uh, special relativity. To go to orientation, to distinguish the past from the future, you have to go to low past entropy. I mean, there are traces only because uh, entropy was low in the, in the past. So this is definitely something which is an open problem. I believe that low past evidence is perspectival. I've written about that. I'm not going to convince you in one second. There are books about that. But this has nothing to do with the fundamental time here. And, uh, and uh, to understand what is this thing about passing, this sort of Heideggerian uh, open space in the wood, which is our sense of time, this is not a problem of fundamental physics. This is a problem in people studying the brain. Our brain works thanks to entropy that keeps growing by using the traces and by building up as anticipation of the future. So if we want to connect our experien experiential time to physics, we have to go through a study of the brain. We cannot go into, look into the equation of quantum gravity. It has nothing to do uh, down uh, there. There are books about time. This is a, a fantastic book, Your Brain is a Time Machine. The neuroscience and physics of, uh, uh, of time, which all based on that. In a, in a context in which you have entropy, and therefore you have traces, and in which, because of that, you could have evolution building a brain, all these things happen which are a memory or anticipation, which is what we call the flow of time. Mixing all this in a single story... Uh, How do you explain this to in terms of... When you have special relativity, you actually can slow time. So yeah. How this is related to this brain thing you're saying? It's not at all. I mean, this 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 uh, makes perfectly sense within a non-relativistic approximation. And if you in special relativity you go fast, of course your own uh, clock time is uh, is shorter, and then your sense of time is going to be short. So it's, it, it, there's no inconsistency. There are a lot of steps we understand badly here, of course. I mean, why low entropy was in the past, the brain we certainly haven't figured out. But trying to mix up these problems with these problems uh, is a confusion, in my opinion. So moral, do not search in elementary physics what is not in elementary physics. Mm -hmm. It's perfectly consistent to write a fundamental theory which doesn't have all the temporal aspects that we so intuitively are attached to. So what? I mean, we are very attached to up and down, and in Newtonian physics we know up and down. This doesn't confuse us. We know the story in between. It's a long story in between. Okay, last, uh, and uh, this is the very last point. Uh, uh, this was very much for Michel Bitbull, but since he's not here, um, I just want to say the title of that, since I, I, I closed the panoramic of what I think the conceptual aspect of uh, um, there is a deeply relational aspect uh, in general relativity. The localization of something only means what, what's around it. In general relativity, you don't localize things in space-time, because the things you're talking about are space-time geometries. So, uh, black hole solution, a Schwarzschild solution is not somewhere. It's somewhere once you have two black holes. You can say where one has with... with and uh, so the relation aspect is that y you have uh, regions and you have boundary between regions. Now in quantum mechanics you have very much the same structure. You have systems and interaction between systems. It is my opinion which to do quantum gravity, if you put these two things together you understand things much better. Namely, you um, should identify si the system, the quantum system, the Bohr <coughs> system, with space-time region, and the observer with its boundary. And uh, I like relational quantum mechanics, it's particularly uh, designed to do, to do that. Of course, other ways of thinking quantum mechanics could, could, could work equally. So a, a, a quantum mechanical experiment is also a preparation and a measurement, and if you think in this term, um, the, the, the only thing you need is the amplitude 
from an initial state to a national a national state. You measure something, you have an amplitude, you have probability distribution of what uh, uh, what what uh, what comes out. That's my last slide, and it's just a summary of everything you said. In, I said in which I have the list of things um, said at the beginning, a little bit uh, qualified. We do not. Um, we do have quantum theories, plural of gravity. We do not know which is right, and none of this is complete. There are serious open problems in each one of them. But I completely follow Steve uh, in that. Uh, uh, we are working better if we don't do the thing that I myself do very often, which is keep pointing out the limitation of the other theories. Of course, we know they are there uh, in all these theories. We know that I don't know to take the n going to infinite limit in loop quantum gravity. I have the landscape problem in string, and so on and so forth, etc., etc. There are limitations. Um, this is different from our prejudices that we have that uh, we don't look at other theories. There are theories, there are calculations, there are. Uh, let's be happy with that. And uh, uh, we do have already some empirical evidence that uh, rule out some theory, favor, disfavor, some, and so on and so forth. And this is going to grow. And that, I think, is a, it's, it's a half full uh, glass. Uh, regarding philosophy, I think that uh, physical space, uh, quantum gravity definitely gives a perspective that sort of bring together, like already is in classical general relativity, the relational aspect of space uh, that is in Newton and Descartes uh, with the material, the, the, the entity aspect of uh, space which is Newton by understanding that Newton space is a field, it's made by quanta and uh, it's the, the, the continuous field is just a classical approximation of, uh, of it. Physical time, uh, I think one can perfectly well work in terms of uh, uh, computing transition amplitude and relation between variables, forgetting about the need of a fundamental uh, time. Uh, this seems very uh, disorienting, but it's because we are trying to put experiential time down to quantum gravity, where it's not its place. We have to understand this tower of properties of time, how they come up at, uh, at, value level, uh, at various levels. And uh, finally, I just skipped, uh, sketched very recently, I think there's a deeply sort of relational aspect, both in GR and quantum mechanics, that have to uh, be merged uh, um, to, to, to be able to work with quantum gravity. Thank you. quick comment and a question. Uh, the comment is that in your slide at the beginning about prejudices, you had asymptotic safety in the section of uh, no, no limit to, to scale. Um, there are some pretty good arguments that if you measure scale in terms of the renormalized physical Planck length, that asymptotic safety leads you to a minimum length. So it might be at least... To be moved. Yeah, or at least somewhere sitting in between. This is the Italian in Trieste, is a... uh, I'll have to check. Uh, okay. There, there's a... Bercacci. Yeah, no. No. Um, well, I'm not sure. There's a review of minimum length by... Which, include, Felder, which includes... Which includes has a bunch of references to okay. that. Thank you. Um, the question you. has to do with uh, time without time in, in your uh, loop formulation, where you, you say that the, the time is intrinsic in the, the boundary data. Uh, I still don't quite understand what that means for normalization of wave functions. If your boundary is uh, something like the Cauchy surface, then I can see how that intrinsic data would give you a normalization of your amplitudes. But if it's not, how do you determine normalization of transition amplitudes? Um, yes, very good. This is the this is the. Um, uh, this is the key technical question for doing that, in fact. 
And uh, uh, the, the full answer is a bit long, so let me give you the, the, key, the key point. Um, if I measure the position of a particle, I can ask a question, which is what's the probability of having the particle here rather than here or here or here or here or here or here, or here everywhere in the universe? And probability is always probability out of a set. It's not probability by itself doesn't mean anything. Uh, what is uh, um, well? Um, so if I ask the question, where is the particle here, as opposite to somewhere else? Of course, I have to have a probability distribution such that the sum of all the probability or everywhere in space uh, is uh, uh, it's one. So I need some sort of space-like surface where I know for sure that the particle is. Now, uh, one can turn the question around and use um, the... Uh, ask the question, the following question. I have a detector here, which is on here and say from, from small time interval, uh, and I know the initial state. What is the probability that it clicks versus it does not click? I have only two alternatives. It clicks, it doesn't click. And uh, I don't need to know whether the particle is somewhere else. I need to know that the sum of the two probabilities have to one. Okay. Uh, so now is, this is a story. I have my relevant table space, and I have two subspaces. One is a space of what I know, and one is a space where I want to know whether it's yes or no. And the ratio of the two dimensions, essentially, is the probability of that measure giving yes versus giving no. That's a structure. Um, there are a number of work trying to do that, but that's exactly the key, the key technicalities that, or that has to be addressed uh, to give up a Schrodinger revolution, essentially. So, uh, if you start with quantum mechanics, uh, there is a um, collapse of the wave function, and uh, this seems to presuppose the direction of time. Uh, then, if you unify quantum mechanics with general relativity, uh, you would expect uh, this unified theory to uh, still have a direction of time at this level of this theory, not in some new uh, science and so on. Uh, so, um, if you then have a relative observer, well, your, your conception of um, time, uh, then you can have a change of one variable with respect to the other, or the change in the second variable with respect to the first. Uh, isn't, is it, isn't it likely that this kind of conception will uh, make uh, fail um, the, the, the effect of having the unique error of time, which, uh, however, uh, seems to be possible yeah. in quantum mechanics. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I got the question. Um, the answer is that uh, um, I would dispute uh, your first line. This has been long debated, uh, and uh, uh, still now there are um, different opinions. Two typical champions of the opposite are Penrose and uh, Hu Price. Um, uh, uh, standard non-relativistic quantum mechanics, uh, as it is usually formulated in textbooks, has a time orientation, there's no doubt. Be between, be between this measurement and this measurement, uh, the wave function is the one of the past, and not the one of the future. Okay? But um, the predictions of standard textbook quantum mechanics do not have an orientation. And I, this is a strong statement, namely, if I, if I make a sequence of experiments, many, many times, because it's probabilistic, okay? So I, I have a spin up, spin like that, spin like that, spin like that, and I have a sequence of experiments. And I, I write all the results to you, to, down, and I give them to you, and I ask you to reconstruct whether time goes in this direction or this direction, you cannot. It's a statement. So therefore, the predictions of quantum mechanics are uh, T invariant, exactly like prediction of classical mechanics. The wave function in between, it's, I think this is the strongest argument indicating that the wave function in between should not be taken ontologically. It's just that if we think that we know the past and not the future, then the wave function is uh, information about the past and not the future. 
So that's, in my opinion, the strongest argument for an epistemic interpretation of the wave function rather than a realistic interpretation, ontological interpretation of the wave function. Now, if you accept this, which is disputed by some, but I would say is agreed by most, <laughs> but, but uh, um, if you accept this, uh, uh, then your question falls. Namely, quantum mechanics by itself, uh, properly formulated, it's invariant at the t going to minus t, so is classical mechanics, so is quantum gravity, so is everything. The only, only, only source we have of time orientation is this fact, so far mysterious, which entropy <coughs> was low in the past universe, and everything can be traced to that. I'm very sympathetic with this idea that we shouldn't be looking uh, into the quantum level, I mean, the, the experience of time. And so, um, yeah, you are right. I mean, whatever is the approach quantum gravity, is, as string theories, or as a loop quantum gravity, uh, definitely um, you have these dynamics, even if you posit a time arrow in addition to the dynamics, definitely there is a problem in explaining how is it that this time arrow posited at the fundamental level might account, might cause my exactly. experience of time. Exactly. Because it's not really the same. Ha it's not I that. Mean, let's say I take a, a metaphor, like the presence of the, lo the physical presence of the laptop on your desk is causing my impression that there is a laptop there. We can't really apply this kind, this line of reasoning in, in uh, according, I mean, sticking to the idea that you posit a time arrow at some fundamental level. So I totally agree with you. On the other side, you say, yeah, it's a multi-layer concept. Uh, and you are giving here a list of thermodynamics, biology, brain science, and Maybe there is something that you are leaving out here. I don't know if it's oh, really it's just a genuine idea. question. Yeah. So when you say experiential, experiential, sorry, time is understood in terms of all this stuff. So what do you really mean with understood? Because uh, that's my problem. I mean, it's you know the the the, the Galileo problem of the, deciding to understand the relation between between primary qualities and secondary qualities. Right? It's still there. I mean, nobody really. Um, found the solution, and so it seems that even if you refer to the Brian's brain science and you try to ground your experience of time on brain science, still there is this gap which is not filled because still your own subjective experience of time is not. Um, it's pretty much like the, the, the feeling of heat in the cup of coffee, right? And, and you keep thinking, okay, how is it that the feeling of heat in my hand? connect to the kinetic energy of this molecule it's a cup of coffee. But there is something about experience, the, set, the qualia, which, is, which sounds to us, in an ordinary way of thinking, irreducible to, to the statistical mechanics. So when you say understood in, in the slides before, that now it's gone. <laughs> so you mean, so are you using some sort of reductive approach? Yeah. To, um. Because it's not three. I mean, it's not. It's a philosophical point. Uh, yeah. So, so what do you mean exactly with understood? Because so, I, I do think there are some aspects of the perception of time, experience of time, which which belongs more to the domain of qualia, the secondary quality. Yeah. And you are listing here neuroscience, which yeah. is on the other side. The, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, let me try to answer in, uh, in as clearly as I can. Uh, first, when I said I wrote understood, I didn't mean. Yeah, it, it, it was understood. I, I, I said it has to be understood. It has to be served. first. Wait, wait, first. Okay. So let me be clear. I'm not yeah, yeah, claiming no, no, no. that in this no, book. No, you might have understood. And in that case, I would be very interested to know more. Yeah, yeah. No, no, yeah. But this is not the yeah, yeah. main answer. Um, the main answer is that I do stand on the idea that uh, uh, there's a lot to understand from brain, brain science that is God. Okay. The main point for me is not this one. The main point is this. Uh, whether um, this experiential yeah. time has to do with neuroscience or has to do, cashed in, in terms of your philosophy, whatever you think about qualia, um, because you don't, for, for, for all possible reasons, because you don't accept naturalism, because uh, yeah. whatever, that's fine. 
That's nothing to do with quantum gravity. That's my point. I, I totally agree. So uh, if you want to add another line here, and and uh, which is um, um, larger philosophical problems about subjectivity, fine, you you can add. But this is a different discussion, and in any case, it's not up there in quantum gravity. Is that an answer? Yeah, yeah, that was. Uh, I have an objection with your uh, statement that if you do a, a field of a quantum mechanical uh, succession of events, and if I run it backward, I will see the same movie. You see, le let me be very specific. Imagine that I, I do the following. I do a two-slit experiment, and uh, uh, I, I, so you send photons to two slits, okay? And I register the points where the photon lands, okay? Now, I, I, I do that for a billion times, okay? So I, I register something which will give me the interference pattern. If I run it backwards, what do I see? I see that from the target, some photon is sort of going backwards and landing at the same point. What does it mean? And it's, it's starting from any point of the target. Yeah, this is, a, this is very similar to the, to the, to the, the uh, mental experiment that Penn was discussed in the paper, trying to make this point. Uh, there's a very careful discussion of that in this book here, uh, U price time, times arrow. And uh, uh, the, the, the question, the yes, I'm yes, yes, but let me, let me know. The point is that in, 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 in formulating these questions, uh, um, you have to distinguish uh, the case in which uh, uh, there is a time orientation in the question itself and uh, the case in which there isn't. So um, I gave an example in which you have a, a, a T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, T6, a, a sequence of uh, spin uh, measurement from which I, I, I would get the probabilities. Um, if, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Hugh analyzed exactly also the, your example, um, it's very easy to come out with experiments where there is a time orientation, but it's always clear that this is an experiment in which you assume that in one of the two directions of time there was something peculiar. Right? So, if I give you uh, many pictures of an expanding gas, uh, it's very easy to find <laughs> to see the direction of time. Right? The gas expanded that, but then in all your runs there was one end uh, which was peculiar. Yeah. So you have to put yourself in a situation in which there is nothing peculiar at the end. So for instance, you do a, 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 a you make a sharp measurement of an eigenstate at the end and then something that does not commute. And uh, and then there is a it's mathematical because the modulus square of the probability amplitude is, is time reversal when you Except shift you are in the weak interactions when it doesn't work. Ah no, no, good, fantastic. Um, the universe is not invariant under t minus t. The universe is invariant under CPT, as far as we know. So I should qualify. The universe is invariant under t minus t, provided that one reverts the sense of the magnetic field, one reverts the charge in minus charge, and, and so on and so forth. Which is something that confuses David Albert, which is a famous article saying that uh, electromagnetism is not time reversal invariant. And he standard at that. And the reason is that if you take E and B and evolving time, and you take the same E and same B and you roll backward, they don't satisfy the Maxwell equation. Why? Because you have to switch B in minus B for <laughs> that Maxwell equation. But that's not what you're interested in, right? Exactly. Excuse me. When you say there is no existence for the time, you mean only for the micros microscopic scale, or uh, you said there is just uh, like. Uh, no existence in the microscopic scale, and after that, there is emergence of time <coughs> in our scale. The the absence of a single time variable uh, playing the same role as Newtonian time at the time of our experience is already in classical general relativity. I mean, if you have a, if you have two, uh, we were talking with uh, Gary this morning. If you have two clocks, two watches, you put one up, one down. Wait a little bit, you can back together. You compare them. They have different readings. Which one is time? The one up or the one down? Yeah. Same. So in general relativity, there isn't a time. There are the, there are the readings of a clock. Along each line, there is a proper time. So time is a concept that becomes more and more complex the more you 
enlarge the, the area of phenomena that you are considering. And uh, in general relativity, you can still define proper time, and we know how to do that. In quantum gravity, you can talk about transition amplitude as a function of this clock or the other clock. Oh, there is a, a, a delicate point which I see now, which is the following, which is that uh, when you write the uh, final integral with the imaginary exponent, so which is the one that you are dealing with, uh, even for classical quantum field theory in flat space, the, when you write down the final integral with that, you 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 can go because you need the i epsilon trick of Feynman in order to to perform the integration. Otherwise, you you have a divergence. See, you need to go around the pole, and in order to go around the pole, you have to give the direction of time. So so uh, isn't that a problem for the type of because you see what I mean is that. Many people say quantum physics very well. You just put the imaginary exponent and then you make a final integral. That however is, is is wrong. It's just wrong because you have to give the epsilon prescription if you want to, to have a meaningful result. So so for that reason, I would see there an appearance of the direction of time, and I would be a little bit doubtful that you can perform calculations if you don't input this. So what I mean, this is a virtue of the Euclidean framework. Uh, which makes the vector convergent and so on, but the price to pay is that exactly you, you made this choice of the i epsilon versus minus i epsilon. Yeah, I see what you're saying. The 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 Wheeler David equation is real. Sorry? The Wheeler David equation, unlike the Schrödinger equation, is, is real. So the propagators of, of the, ana the analogs of the propagate of the Wheeler David equation have both the forward in time and backward in time evolution. No? So, exactly. So the question is how you should. Yes. Uh, it, it's hidden in the fact that you're giving a, a bound, is a boundary state that you choose uh, uh -huh. that... Uh, oh, well, you mean, the, 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 like you choose the one which... You yeah, from, yes. Uh, you have uh, somehow, here you have to give uh, uh, average position, momentum, time and energy, and you choose the positive energy or the negative energy. So if you start with a wave packet which is moving forward, then uh, it's uh, it's propagator the propag it's, it's a forward part that works. So, I have a vague question, maybe. Uh, it's, uh, regarding this, uh, usually what we the older time when uh, Dewey tried to quantize it, uh, quantum gravity, the first Dewey paper. So he he usually expresses this uh, Hamiltonian constant of primary. Let's say, uh, so. <coughs> They don't require this. There is no time evolution corresponding to. So, are you saying that that is that counts as a kind of evidence for non-existence of time? Yes, uh, non-existence of time at the fundamental as, uh, as something needed for this quantum gravity. So, this is a if you want. This is the bit theory. Uh, Thirty years later, with uh, more proper variables. And instead of having a constraint with directly the, the transition amplitudes, uh, but it's basically that. Yes, yeah, so when it operator, when when you elevate it to operators, it gives the Dewey equation, relativity yeah. equation. Yeah. In fact, I form guess. formally, yeah. um, I mean, we're not able to do that, but uh, intuitively, the this um, um, the the state, the the the, the transition amplitudes. Uh, if you change the state a little bit, the, the should be given by Willard the width operator. If you, if you forget all the infinities and the thing, it's true. If you if you just work naively. So I've heard. I have a question about the exploding black holes. I still don't really get why that should happen. Um, ah. I mean, if I have a star that's collapsing and going to make a supernova. There's some probability, I guess, that just before it forms a neutron star, it turns around and goes out the other way because the wave function has a small tail yeah. that's outgoing and not ingoing. Super is that all you're saying? <laughs> In other words, what is, what is making this thing bounce? It seems like it can't possibly be the right answer. Okay, good. Uh, we, we, we spent this summer discussing these things. So, so let me give you my best last, last, last understanding of this. Um, let, let me take the worst case scenario. Um, the suppression factor for this to happen 
is the one given naively by semi-classical gravity, so e to the minus uh, the action over h bar. The action is m square, the, the area, which is the dimension of, of, of h bar, h bar g, in fact. So for a macroscopic black hole, you have a suppression factor, which is e to the m, uh, the mass of the black hole, namely the, the area of the black hole, for over the Planck area. So it's a grammatically suppression factor, so it's not going to happen. That's essentially what you're going to say. Naive uh, semi-classical intuition tell us that tunneling does not happen for macroscopic things. Good. Um, still, this is going to still happen later on, in the following sense. Uh, we, let me fold in now what was disregarded before, which is uh, Hawking radiation. So slowly, sort of adiabatically, the black hole becomes smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. As it becomes small, uh, it, it, its mass uh, gets close to the Planck mass, and the area gets close to the Planck area. So at some point, some suppletto factor, so this suppression factor, e to the minus m over n Planck, goes to 1. So at some point, it's so small that it's going to happen. So you're imagining a long period of Hawking evaporation until it reaches near the Planck size, and then it explodes? That is the worst case scenario. So in, in the worst case scenario, in the sense, if, if, the, if, the, if there's nothing enhancing this probability, this phenomenon is going to happen not when the thing is larger, but when the thing has already been uh, reduced to Planckian or a bit more than Planckian size. Uh, and it's still very interesting because it tells us how the black hole ends. That's what we all want to know, right? This is a story about how the black hole ends. And in fact, it tells us that what comes out is a white hole with a long tail and not, a, and not pops into nothing. It's a white hole with a short throat but a long tail, which takes a long time then to evaporate. Mm -hmm. So it, it, even in the worst case scenario, this is how the black hole ends. Now, separated from that, uh, we have argument to say that uh, the suppression is not as bad as e to the minus m squared, so this may happen before. But you may say, well, this contradicts my idea about uh, uh, macroscopic object, uh, and uh, I'm not sure my arguments are going to convince you, because they are indirect arguments. But if you want to see these things in practice, you need to overcome this factor? Or? Uh, <clears throat> depending, the, the, the papers on phenomenology, most papers on phenomenology takes this to happen between m square and m cube. So they cover all possible cases. And uh, this will give signals uh, in, the, uh, in the high, uh, high energy signals, which are essentially the photon traps inside that come out. If it is m square, so if, if we are down to the most favorable <laughs> and the most unintuitive case, which we are trying to compute and we are struggling with it, then um, uh, m, m, uh, t m square t Hubble time give m square uh, the mass of a little planet uh, and the dimension of uh, millimeters, centimeters, uh, which is where the fast radio bursts are. So the fast radio burst, uh, I, the idea that this could be one of the components of fast radio burst uh, requires uh, this happening much before Hawking evaporation. So that will be killed if, if the, really the suppression is e to the minus m squared. Uh, the, the TV energy uh, photons, no. So there's a phenomenology range where people are looking. Just one, one clarification regarding uh, time, going back to the time issue. So you mentioned the direction of time, evolution, but then more basically the very notion of succession not being given together at the same time. How does it fit in the scheme? Is it, uh, is it taken care of by the internal flow idea? Or is I there think something even more basic that is presupposed from the start, that there is such a thing as succession as opposed to everything being given at once? I, I don't have a clear answer to that. You, you may talk with Alain about that. But there is a key in, in, intuition, uh, counter Alain, in fact, that, uh, that uh, the, 
uh, in quantum mechanics, uh, uh, the, the, the element of the algebra, the operators, the, the, which are the, the, the event, the thing, the, the thing we observe, uh, don't commute. Now, don't commute means that uh, A before B or B before A uh, are different, have different effects. So there is a, in, written in the algebra something that does not commute, uh, which somehow Alain has been suggesting, look, this is the... Uh, this is a, a, a sort of a, a first manifestation of temporality. I mean, it doesn't have all the property of time that... Uh, um, and then, remarkably, uh, Alain has shown that this is... Uh, it's actually related to this inner flow uh, in an algebra. Uh, um, if you have a von Neumann algebra of uh, type. Now, to go from there on, uh, it, it's a long story, but I think uh, this captures something core about temporality. Can I add something? Uh, no, I, I just want to add one, one, one uh, sort of philosophical uh, comment about this issue of, of, of time. You see, uh, we are <coughs> used to attribute any variability in life to the passing of time. I mean, this is what we do, you know. For instance, I had a teacher when I was in high school, uh, not in high school, in a preparatory school for Grand Ecole. And uh, once he, he asked me to go to the blackboard, and uh, he, has, he, he did this gesture. And, uh, and so we were doing uh, kinematics, and so he asked me, what is the parameter? So, you know, I scratched my head. I was thinking perhaps the X coordinate or something. And after a while, I answered, it's time. And he told me, this is right. Okay? So, so now, now uh, uh, there is another variability which has been observed and confirmed incredibly well, which is the variability in quantum mechanics. By variability, I mean the following. I mean that if you repeat the same experiment, like a two-slit experiment or like a one-slit experiment, that would be enough, you will find a result which is actually random. This is so true that there is a Swiss team which has made um, an apparatus to fabricate random numbers by, on a cell phone by using this principle. And, and the system is so good that even if you knew all the apparatus uh, to the extreme, you would not be able to predict the random number, which would not be true for a computer fabricated random number. So there is a randomness in the quantum, which is, I believe, the true variability. I, I believe that we are too used to attribute all the variability and write down all our equations in physics as d by dt. Because we attribute all the variability to the passing of time. And then we are surprised that when we have entangled photons and so on, we cannot, uh, we, can, we say that there is a spooky action at a distance that actually interacts between the two. So what I believe is that we have to get rid of that prejudice, that everything is a function of time. And, and we have to, to rely on this variability, which is quantum, okay, and which, as Carlo has explained, actually does generate a classical time when you take a thermal state. So it, it has the potential of actually being interpreted as a classical time, but it's very subtle. It's something which is thermodynamical and so on and so forth. But what I am trying to say philosophically is that we are probably wrong to attribute the variability to the passing of time. That's a cheating. That's a, you were saying it as uh, Newton's, uh, you know, of course it, it's very useful, it makes things very nice and so on, but probably philosophically it's a mistake. That's what I would say. Can I ask something? I was confused by what you just said about the commutation relations and possible connection with the order of time. Because these commutation relations, are, that's about equal time commutators. No, 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 this is not what he's saying. No, no, no. Well, let him say what no, he said. No, 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 you see, what, 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 what you no, no, but this is a very important point. You see, the, the, the thing which is behind the emergence of time from the non-commutativity, okay, uh, it's essentially the following. It's essentially that if you take a state, uh, statistical state, and you evaluate it on A, B, Okay. Of course, in general, if the state is not a trace, you will not get the same result as if you evaluate it on BA. Yes. But it turns out that there is a, 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 a time evolution, which, which is due to Tomita, which will tell you that when you evaluate phi of 
not on A on B A, but on B and A transformed by a certain operator, which is evaluated at imaginary time, then you get the same result. And this is the key. So the key is the following. The key is that when the algebra is... So, and this relation is exactly the relation between the Heisenberg evolution and the Gibbs uh, uh, state. You see, when you have the Heisenberg evolution, you have the conjugacy by exponential ith, a exponential minus ith. Okay? On the other hand, the equilibrium state is the uh, trace of exponential minus beta h times an observable. Now, these two things are related exactly by the relation I told you. So the point now is the following. The point is that, OK, this relation is very simple in ordinary quantum mechanics. But when you do not take quantum mechanics ordinary, but when you take uh, quantum mechanics with ignorance, which is essentially the framework of von Neumann. So what you do is you take an operator algebra, which is very subtle inside. So it's like a subsystem, if you want, of the, of the whole quantum mechanical system. Then it turns out that it has an evolution, this evolution, and it's infinitely more subtle than in the case of a single state like as before. But what it tells you is that because of the non commutativity the algebra is actually turning on itself. And, and, and this is an amazing fact. You see, this is absolutely an amazing fact. And it turns on itself only because it's non commutative That's the only reason why it turns on itself. So, uh, okay, I mean, the reason why we know each other, Carlo and, and I, is that at some point we <coughs> met, and uh, okay, I had this theorem since a long time, but I didn't know any way to relate it to physics. I had tried with quantum field theory, nothing. And, uh, and uh, so I, I met Carlo, Carlo was doing the same type of talks, I mean, I, I bothered him, uh, <laughs> like hell during his talk. <laughs> and, uh, but, but then we talked together, and at some point I explained this theorem to him, and it disappeared. We were having dinner together. Carlo disappeared. So I was saying, okay, maybe I said something. <laughs> insulting or something. Like but then he came back five minutes later and he showed me two papers that he had written one year before, two years before. And in these two papers, he had found from philosophical thinking. Okay, I, I, I really found this admirable. From philosophical thinking, he had found that in uh, the formulation of uh, uh, quantum gravity where, okay, the Hamiltonian is weakly vanishing and so on and so forth, you don't have the time. So he had the idea of actually saying that you need a thermal state in order to get a time, to recover a time. So, and if you have a thermal state, he had written an equation that actually was relating the thermal state to the time. That equation was a semi-classical limit of my equation. So then we got, you know, we got really fascinated by this because, okay, even if we don't say it right, even, there, there must be something. There must be something behind. I mean, and, and this is what, you know, what we are discussing and so on. I mean, it's not a, at all a trivial matter, but the hope, the really, I think the philosophical idea, which is behind it, is that we are wrong to attribute every variability to the passing of time. This is a consequence of natural selection on our brain because this is the most efficient way to act in the external world. But in fact, you know, we, we are in the quantum. We are living in a quantum world. And uh, in the quantum world, okay, you know, things are more subtle. This is, uh, this is uh, how things are. Uh, there is another way to say what you are saying. Yeah, okay. That if uh, you can C minus, plus C or minus C, it looks uh, symmetric. But causality is not. And the change of C to minus C yeah. has to be uh, conceived in physics of causality. And causality is not symmetric. Because the same state of affairs yield the same consequences, um, at least in classical. True, 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 yes. True. Uh, but the causes, you can have different causes sure. that uh, yield the same effect. Sure. Oh, okay, so let me, let me try to answer to this one, because it's, um, this is really... Um, the only guy who has clear ideas on that, which I found intuitive, is Reichenbach, the philosopher. No, uh, Reichenbach, I think the philosopher know it very well. Um, and I think he's right. I mean, he's one of the most well respected uh, uh, philosophers of science uh, in the analytic tradition, the Anglo Saxon tradition. Uh, he has started, I would say, the philosopher here. Yeah. 
Um, I think it's, what he says is true, and uh, you price agrees with that, and uh, I would say the large bunch of philosophers I agree with. Um, the equations of classical, uh, forget quantum for the moment, because the uh, equation of classical mechanics are invariant under T minus T. So as long as we talk about classical mechanics, uh, there is no sense in which causality has one direction rather than the other directions. Namely, given the state of affairs today, you can equally well predict the past and equally well predict the future. And uh, as Einstein has pointed out, uh, the same is true in quantum mechanics, in a beautiful Einstein paper, there is uncertainty in the future, but given the state today, if you want to know what happened in the future, there is equal uncertainty. Now, this dramatic clashes with our experience, of course. And uh, fact, but, but it's a fact. Russell, Bertrand Russell, wrote uh, um, the notion of causality has disappeared from elementary physics, is gonna go away from, you know, the quotation, go away from uh, science uh, and is remaining there uh, just because, uh, like the monarchy, is, is in, uh, it's believed to do no, no damage, but it's not true. Uh, um, but then, of course, in philosophy there have been a big discussion, cartridge uh, and so on, say, so, wait a minute, we, we, we think in terms of causes all the time. I mean, you, you cannot ask them, to ask us to, I mean, a medical doctor wants to think in terms of causes as well. So the question is, uh, where does the notion of causality, Riker by himself talk about common causes, which are two things happening in different places, you look for a common cause, if there is a, um, I don't know, tsunami wave arriving to island, then you think there is one uh, earthquake in the past, not in the future. Okay, why the common causes? And there is only one possible answer to this question, I believe, and a lot of people believe, which is because entropy was low in the past. So the existence of traces, the orientation of the causal arrow that we, we use, uh, is there because we live in a strongly thermodynamically oriented uh, situation. Of course, that entropy grows is not mysterious at all, because things, uh, the mysterious things is why it decreases in the past. I mean, why, why if we look back in the past, there is something. So I do think that uh, the arrow of time, which is implicit in causality, which we use all the time in science, uh, sits solidly and uniquely on low past entropy as a fact in our universe. Now, whether we put it as a postulate like uh, David Albert, uh, past hypothesis, uh, as an hypothetical law at the Big Bang, like Penrose Vial hypothesis, uh, or whether we try to derive it from something else. I try to derive something else in this perspectival paper, maybe it's bullshit, I don't know, but that's an, an attempt. Uh, there is nothing else in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, the physics that distinguishes past from future, and in particular in quantum mechanics. It's nothing that is past from future, uh, if not this past law entity. That's my strong conviction. Maybe. Could it be the reverse, the, the thermodynamical uh, yeah. uh, argument comes from uh, causality? So. <laughs> It's, we're not going to solve this here. I mean, this is... In causal <laughs> set theory, they posit causality as, as the That's primary thing, of course. Yeah, I mean, the theory is formulated from point zero in a strongly time-oriented manner. So they say it starts from that, and then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. So they always have trees-like graphs. That's in the line with what you said. That should have to. You don't have to. No. You're right. Uh, they, that, that doesn't have to. You're right. Yeah, that's the way they talk, there's, but that's yeah. not the way it can be for. Yeah, right. there, there's an approach to the dynamics of You're causal right. sets that has that. Like you can define causal sets in terms of path integrals. And, and then it becomes and then it becomes time. Yeah. You mean you, in causal sets you have oriented graph or unoriented graph? Uh, Depend who you talk to. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, in, in principle unoriented, oh, in principle, there yeah, is a okay, proposed okay. dynamics for causal sets, uh, growth dynamics, exactly. 
that involves <coughs> giving the graph an orientation. Uh -huh. Okay. I understand. So you mean but, you, but, like the old cases. Okay. But here, in all these cases, her objection comes in, and that's a crucial one. I mean, you might have a quantum gravity where there's a strong time orientation, like causal set people, not the others, <laughs> want. But how the hell that time-oriented uh, uh, produces a time reversal invariant classical mechanics in which we live, where Time is strongly oriented. So we're looking, uh, we're back to the wrong tree. I mean, uh, even if down there there is some strong violation, what's, what's, the, what's the story? It's, uh, I don't think it has to be so much there. It has no causal power at all. It has no explanatory role at all. Even if you pause it, it's strong time power. It doesn't explain how is it that we experience. Exactly, exactly, exactly. You, you, even if you pause it, uh, you cannot use it to, 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 to derive our. Uh, but Steve and Gabriele have convinced us that the gravitational, <laughs> gravitational quantum will solve all these problems. <laughs> well, <laughs> you still have to fill the second half of the glass. <laughs> well, in, the, in, the, in connection with the past low entropy, maybe one can put also this entropy bound that people have discussed, particular Busso, but also and others. So, uh, in that sense, at the, say, near the Big Bang, the, the, the entropy bound, so the entropy was low, but because the, the bound on entropy was low. As the universe expands, this bound gets relaxed. And so there is room for entropy in case. You, you so have to... That might partially explain the, the error of time, if you believe in this holographic entropy bound. So in that sense, you, you relate the error of time to the evolution of the universe and the direction in which entropy increases. But you don't need a, a real fine-tuning of the initial entropy. It was as big as it could be, <coughs> but later it could be large. Pen, pe, Penrose, no, Penrose argues that, that this yeah. like so, it's a different. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, perhaps we should stop here and have a, a break, and maybe after the break we can have a round table to continue the discussion. So we don't thank our speaker again.